Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today is Tuesday and we are continuing this read of The Song of Roland. So I haven't gotten very far into the poem itself, but I finished the introduction, which was very helpful and very interesting. And a couple of observations more since I spoke with you guys yesterday. One thing to keep in mind as we're reading this book that has become very apparent from the first few stanzas, or laissez, le, le I guess, laissez, laissez, I think is how it's pronounced. That's the term that I saw in the introduction, which is apparently the correct term for what I would, if I looked at it, I would call it a stanza, but apparently it's not, it's a laissez. Anyway, so it, this is not working in the genre of a romance. We haven't really developed that genre yet, like I talked about with the Arthurian romances by Chrétien de Troyes that I read maybe about a month ago, and I have some videos about. Actually, I'm in a vortex of time. It was a lot longer than that because it was at the beginning of COVID, so. Yeah, but anyway, I'll link those videos where I was talking a lot about the sort of structure and purpose, what I think the ro the medieval romances were trying to do. The Song of Roland is working in an older style of a, a, a an epic story style, that something that would feel more familiar, say, to like a Beowulf, or, or again, even to the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Aeneid, sort of working in this epic style where we're talking about these great feats of men, usually in warfare, with brothers in arms, the main relationships that these have emotional impact in these stories are these brotherly deep friendships that exist between these male characters. And it's really interesting because even as I was reading the introduction in the early parts of this book, I could see how even in the romance genre, as it develops through you know, the Arthurian romances and throughout the Middle Age or medieval times, medieval literature, how this period as depicted in the Song of Roland is kind of looked back at with a sense of nostalgia and honor. So the idea of like, you know, being a warrior, being prepared for warfare, the value of your armor, the value of your horse, the instable or the instability of society. I talked about that also with the Arthurian romances, but it would probably be even more so true at this time, which is a little bit earlier, and how, you know, your literal ability as a physical combatant was so essential for your survival and for the survival of the people around you, which then also speaks to the feudal system, which by the 1100s in France and England is really breaking up. But the story definitely talks about a classic feudal system or is imagining a world in which that's still sort of quite in play. And I think for those of us who live in the modern world, it's hard to really imagine how decentralized power was. So even though we're telling a story about Charlemagne and you know a king of France, a very powerful king of France, a very well-regarded king of France, we also see how decentralized the power is. That is that you have the system of liege and lord and vassal, this, you know, this honor system. And really the person who has the most authority and the greatest claim on you is the person who's closest to you hierarchically. It's the person who is like sort of your direct leader. So in democratic principles, you know, it's like my mayor would have more power over you, over me than my governor and my governor would have more power over me and uh, more of a right to call upon, you know, the promise that I've made to him and, and my devotion than would the President of the United States. And this becomes really important when we think about the battle because it's not like King Charles is just like, oh, let me raise the troops from France. It's like, no, let me go to my barons and my lords and let them raise the troops in the areas where they have their sort of allegiances and their vassals sort of tied to them. And then those like smaller lords then go to the people below them and then to the people below them. And then it's like, that's how you raise the troops. But the minute, you know, some lesser lord dies or is lost in battle, like all of the troops that are loyal to him and that came with him, like they're kind of free to go. Like they don't have an obligation to anybody else except for that one guy that is directly above them. So it's a very decentralized sense of power. And in fact, 
there was a lot of ways in which if you were sort of a lower lord, you could, you know, a baron or something like that, you could in fact have more power and more wealth than the king during this time. So that's kind of weird to think about in our brain, but it's just really, you know, kind of decentralized power and it's kind of flipped upside down to the way that we think about it. So the conflict set out from the very first section is definitely this idea of the conflict between the cross and the crescent, between Christians and Muslims. And um, it's going to sort of like shrink down in scope, but that's the setup and that is the backdrop for everything that then the specific action is going to take place in. And I think that's something that is good to keep in the back of your mind as you continue reading the text, if you're reading along with me or you're reading along with these videos, because we're gonna see how human perspective sort of gets distracted from what would be considered this sort of like transcendent global spiritual warfare that's happening. It also seems that the author of this poem doesn't necessarily have a very clear idea of what the Muslim faith is. In the first place, they referred to this to this people group as pagans, which really by the technical definition they wouldn't be. They have a sense that they pray to Apollo, which they de definitely would not have been historically. Um, and so it's definitely, you know, these people who are other over there, they will have a different faith, but not really sure what that faith is. Most people probably never would have met a Muslim in their life, so the person who is telling this story or composing this story probably didn't either. So. We have a great advantage in this globalized world to experience other cultures in a way that other people didn't. And I think, you know, one of the things I would walk away from this story with is like, by our modern conceptions, this seems very racist. <laughs> it seems xenophobic. It seems, you know, obviously not very tolerant of other religions and other ideas, but I think it represents the instability of society and culture that conflict was always going to come across these lines. The other person was literally dangerous to you as, as far as their life experiences go. That it, thankfully is not the tri case for, you know, <laughs> almost everybody in our, in our lives. We're just not gonna have that kind of conflict across cultural divide the way that they did at the time. So their xenophobia is rooted in a different reality than than what we experience, which is that people who are different than you were a, a very much a real threat. There were limited resources. They're coming out of an ice age. There's, you know, it's just like, there's just chaos, there's warfare. It's not that they're less civilized than we are. It's just that there was not the infrastructure and stability to be able to support peaceable relations. There wasn't the abundance of food to be able to support peaceable relations the way that we experience it in the modern world. So I think it, you might wanna, I think there's a tendency to be a little bit judgmental and I think it, it's good to take a step back and kind of understand the socio-political reality and the historical reality that these people were facing and where how those ideas sprang up because their experiences would have been vastly different than ours. After laying the groundwork of this sort of global transcendent war, the first thing we get is actually of the Muslim king in Spain, Marsilion, and he decides he's in the city of Saragossa, Saragossa, and he decides to you know, make a suit for peace to Charlemagne. Charlemagne has come in, he's conquered a variety of cities, and now he's finally saying like, oh, I wanna make this suit for peace. He consults with his lords and he sends off his lords sort of promising these gifts and sort of saying like, hey, raising the white flag, carrying the olive branch, we don't wanna fight anymore. And immediately this brings the conflict down from that transcendent level to the socioeconomic level. The next scene that we get is Charlemagne and it's almost a duplicate scene. Both kings are sitting in an orchard, they're sitting surrounded by their court. This here we have like, you know, Eden type imagery going on and it, what Eden represents is sort of the combination of nature and culture. Uh, so you have nature as represented in the flourishing garden, but it's tended by people and it's going to be orderly. You're going to have crops, you're going to have fruits, hence the orchard, rather than just like a wild forest by comparison, right? So, and it's not just a paved street or the middle of the city or a uh, as it was in Beowulf, like a big hall, which would be totally on the other end of the spectrum of just society. This is sort of the combination, the meeting point between um, nature and culture, if you will, or the 
intermixture of it. The appearance of Charlemagne, sort of old with this snowy beard, but still strong and robust, this warrior king, means that he is sort of put into this symbolic language of God the Father. We have more parallelism as Charlemagne holds counsel about what to do. So he goes to his lords just like the other king does, the Muslim king does. And Roland is the first one to speak. Apparently Marsilian has made a previous suit for peace before and dealt treacherously with them. And here's where it helps to note that the bard is singing to an audience with a context that we don't have. Situations, stanzas like these would probably get a little bit confusing if we didn't kind of assume like, oh, okay, he must be talking about something that the audience is supposed to know about, but I don't know about, but the clues are there. They apparently sent over two representatives to, to negotiate this piece and King Marsilian just killed them. <laughs> and it's possible that Roland is recalling the original reason for the conflict. So there's this sense of like, hey, we went into battle for a reason. Let's not stop short. Let's come here to fulfill, you know, what we came here to fulfill. But it's also going to speak and come to fruition because Roland himself is going to be need is going to need to be revenged as well and that's a huge component of this story and so this idea that the king really needs to follow through on the revenge for the death of these lords is very important to roland because that's actually structurally a huge component for the story and really it's a huge component for their culture roland also discusses his own exploits here as if to say that this has been the cost this has been the reason that we've been fighting it's been enough of a reason so far why is it no longer what we're here to do now that we've gotten to Sargosa? And those are all the comments that I have for you. But before I go, I actually wanted to read aloud one of the laissé for you because uh, it really has a different feel, a different rhythm compared to what we're used to, say, with like a Shakespeare type situation with an iambic pentameter. So I wanted to read this to you because uh, it has a real nice rhythm and poetical feel to it. So this is the second one where it's talking about Marsilian and where he is in his council, right? Marsilian sat in Sargosa town. He sought an orchard where shade was to be found. On a bright dais of marble he lays down. By 20,000 his vassals stand around. He calls before him all his dukes and his counts. Listen, my lords, what affliction is ours? The Emperor Charles that wears the fair France's crown invades our country, our fortunes to confound. I have no host, but before him gives ground. I find no force, his forces for to flout. Wise men of wit, give counsel to me now. Save me from death and loss of my renown. There's ne'er a panim, panim is a, the word for pagan. There's ne'er a panim, utters a single sound, till Blancandrin, Valfonda's lord, speaks out. So you can see, um, one is that it's, very poetical, very rhythmic. That rhythm comes through very, very strong, even in this like, translation, so she must have done a good job. And then obviously she's working with end rhyme, which is kind of incidental. They're actually wanting assonance rather than a full full rhyme. And then, what was else was I gonna say? Oh, it's extraordinarily consistent. Like, you know, and, and it really doesn't break from its form, at least so far that I've read. And it's very, very simple and direct and straightforward. So in the reading of this, in order to parse out some of these concepts that are going to be, that I want to talk about, you know, it's it's definitely below the level of what is going on because it's really just telling you straight plot as far as the narration is concerned. There is no description. There are no flights of fancy. It's just straightforward good old rambunctious storytelling. This would be like, you know, once it gets digested, good story to tell around the ye old campfire. It's definitely got that feel and that vibe for it. So that's all I've got for you today. My name is Alexandra, and until next time, I'm still a bibliophile.